Greetings from Castle Gorey, from Mickey, Aurora, and from me. Well, 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 very eventful times. So without further ado, I am going to plunge right in with what Mel Simpson has to say. Hi, lovely lady C. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I cannot understand why Harry and Meghan had to announce to the world that they were going to phone the king to wish him happy birthday. It seems so insincere, disingenuous and unnecessary. They could very easily have done this privately. I'm sure that King Charles was also thrilled to speak to Meghan. It must have made his day nauseating. <laughs> well, Mel Simpson. Interesting question, but you are actually right and you are wrong. It was very necessary that Harry and Meghan had to make the announcement that they had wished the King happy birthday. It might have been disingenuous and it might have been insincere, but it was very necessary. I'm going to tell you why it was necessary for a variety of reasons. First of all, they have to be repairing their reputation and trying to reposition themselves so that they become a marketable brand at the moment nobody wants to buy. Nobody wants to buy. This is a huge problem for Ari Emanuel. Remember who owns Audible? Jeff Bezos? Oh dear, oh dear. Hmm. Didn't Diane von Furstenberg and Barry Dealer just have an engagement party for Jeff Bezos and Lauren Sanchez at their Beverly Hills house? Weren't, hmm, let me see, Kim Kardashian? Chloe Kardashian, Chris Jenner, Robert Pattinson, Suki Wo Waterhouse, Oprah, Miranda Carr, Salma Hayek, Jessica Alba, Cash Warren, Chris Rock, Chris Rock, Gail King, Rita Wilson, without Tom Hanks, Barbara Streisand, and James Brolin. No Harry and Meghan. Can you imagine? No Harry and Meghan. Yet another A-list party that they have not been asked. What is wrong with everybody? The Obamas, you name it. The Oscar Awards Committee, notwithstanding the fact that Meghan and Harry are perpetually available, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, nobody is availing themselves of their availability. And to make it worse, that witch, spelt with a B, Dame, Dame, Dame Anna Winter has dedicated practically a whole issue of Vogue to the engagement and upcoming nuptials of Jeff Bezos and Lauren Sanchez. <laughs> H, how can these people do this to me? <laughs> I just don't get it. I'm the most beautiful and desirable person on earth and nobody's appreciating it except you and even you only appreciate it when I whip you into line <laughs> well let's not forget that the part the most important part of the message that 
Harry and Meghan's people failed to convey to the public was that Harry phoned his father on his father's mobile phone and Meghan spoke to Pa as well on the mobile phone because Meghan just loves nothing more than a daddy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't take my word for it. Ask Thomas Markle Sr. <laughs> the only hitch with all of this is Charles doesn't have a mobile phone. Need I say more? I think you got the message. But what is also interesting is how stories are now being planted that the telephone call between Charles and Harry was a turning point and that there might even be another call next week and that uh, it's hoped that this is a turning point. Well, I'm going to tell you, the reality is that the king, as any parent in a situation like this, would hope that there would be a turning point and would take advantage of any possibility of improved relations, not only on a personal level, but where a monarchy is concerned on a national and an international level. So there is a degree of plausibility where that scenario is concerned. There's also a degree of plausibility about the fact that Meghan and Harry now understand that they are in Siberia, Montecito, Siberia, Hollywood, Siberia, social Siberia, financial Siberia. Nothing's working. Remember a few weeks ago, a bigger deal than the Obamas had with Audible. I think this is one we need to watch because I notice when the stories of kiss and makeup are coming and I don't want to poison anybody's pond but let me put it this way. Stupidity is not my middle name. And now I really think I have said absolutely enough on this matter. Fair Dinkum says, Never have I seen such a stinging rebuke from one politician to no another as Sweller Braverman's gave the politically impotent <laughs> Rishi Sunak, sorry. <laughs> well, there has been a power struggle going on in the Conservative Party. It would be nice if they struggled with the nation's problems rather than with each other, but I suppose that's what you get in a democracy when your choice is between black dog and monkey, as the Jamaicans would put it. And then, even though you're the electorate, you're not even given the choice of black dog or mon monkey, because what happens? A John Canoe jumps into the equation and makes off with all of the prizes. Very Jamaican analogies. Sorry if you don't get the, but maybe just by my tone of voice you get the drift. Well, Swella Braverman's 
resignation letter certainly spelt out her dissatisfaction. I have said before, and I'm going to say again, as a member of the government, she was obliged to clear her public communications first and failed to do so. Clearly, she knew they were going to shoot her down. I have a lot of sympathy for Sweller Braverman. I actually rather liked Sweller Braverman. She stood for something. She stood for clarity. She stood for certainty. And she made a very valid point that if the judiciary shot down the policy with regards to the immigrants, that there was no plan B. And there clearly was the intention to lead the electorate to think that something was going to be done when maybe there was no plan to actually do anything. Hmm. Charming. But there is more going on than just the struggle between the left. Actually, it's not the left. It's the centrist wing with some being left leaning in the Conservative Party and the right wing. And the right wing at the moment has clearly been defeated. Cameron has been brought in back because Cameron is buddy buddy with the Chinese. Now, I have nothing against people making money, and I actually think that the Chinese government's policy of buying into nations and leaving the nations to do as they please, except when it suits the Chinese, and that their interest is usually economic. And as long as the governments of the countries concerned pay lip service to the generosity, shall we say, of the Chinese, everything is left, so the status quo remains the same. This is something that the ancient Roman Empire used to do. So it's not a new philosophy politically. It's a very ancient philosophy politically. I do think that the Chinese are a danger that is not readily acknowledged. I think in the West, I think that the Chinese are actually a lot more dangerous than the Russians ever were or ever could be or ever would be once the Soviet Union ceased to exist. Because when we speak about the Soviet Union, we're not speaking about the Russians, we're speaking about the Soviet Union. Because very throughout much of the Soviet Union's history, it wasn't even led by Russians. It was led by Georgians, Ukrainians, etc., etc. But in any event, they were not nationalists, which Tsarist Russia and post Soviet Russia is nationalist. These are huge distinctions. And Russia is a lot less and has traditionally been, except under the Soviet Union, a lot less of an encroaching power. The Chinese are stealthily gaining influence worldwide via the pocketbook. Well, they're not the only imperialist power on Earth. There's the American state. There's the Chinese state. Those seem to be the two main imperialist powers at the moment. Uh, but 
Rich people like making money. The Chinese, despite being communist in name and totalitarian in ideology, are economically not really communist. They are totalitarian pseudo-capitalists with what appears to be a social policy that is actually a dictatorial economically driven but socially effective policy. Cameron has excellent contacts in China. Rishi, whose father-in-law is one of the most successful businessmen in India. Now, the Indians and the Chinese don't get on particularly well, in case you don't know. But they all like making money together. So, that's really what's going on. It's about prosperity and the most effective ways of making money for as many people as possible. Now, I have nothing against making money, and I certainly think it is a duty of each state to enrich its citizens to the fullest of its ability. But it's interesting how the words left and right have been scrambled in the last few weeks, or maybe six weeks maximum, where what was left is now right, what was right is now left. I mean, very perplexing. But Suella Braverman's letter was a stinging rebuke. Did it have merit? I leave it up to you to decide for yourself. I know what I think. Fern Clement says, do you think the PM would have put David Cameron in the cabinet of Nigel Farage? If, if sorry, it's say O oh, instead of I. If Nigel Farage hadn't gone into the jungle for a while. And do you think this played any part in the decision of the PM? No, I don't think it played any part whatsoever. Nigel Farage is regarded at that level as a cantankerous nuisance. You know, one must never underestimate the personal confidence of people in power, let's put it that way, and their ability to rise above the cares of the average person's opinion. Let me put it that way. The whole David Cameron thing has been quite a while in the making. Nigel Farage, it would have made no difference whether he was in the jungle or out of the jungle where David Cameron's appointment was concerned. What would have made a difference, however, is had he been out of the jungle, he'd have been a lot more vociferous than he is able to be because in the jungle he's muscled. But I think that's pure coincidence. And Carol Fernley says, I despair for the first time in my adult life, I am at an impasse in the decision of where I vote. I have neither trust nor respect for either party. There is nowhere for me to go. There is no alternative. It's either one shower of brown stuff or another shower of brown stuff. I cannot bear to put my precious ex on either of them. Well, Carol Fernley, you're not the only person who feels like this, and that's why I've read out your very succinct and heartfelt comment. Many people in both the United Kingdom and the United States feel like that. 
it's up to us the, to get the politicians we deserve. And if we're not getting them, we need to make enough noise that they will step up to the plate. I would say in a situation like this, the lesser of two evils is preferable to inaction. That's my take on it. And now we go to something rather more interesting in some ways, certainly sexier. The body says, if the friend dropped out, then Frederick should have declined out of respect for his wife, surely, and especially knowing that the press would be all over them and the story they would tell. It was a bad error of judgment on his part. Yes, of course, men are entitled to have friendships outside the marriage, but in his position, he would know this situation would be exploited. No wonder his wife looked mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to make one or two comments. The first thing is, why would he have dropped out? He was there to go to the event. Why was he going to drop out of it? That's the first thing. The second thing is, men who are married to other women all the time go out without their wives and they're allowed to go out with pretty girls as well as ugly or plain girls sorry that's just the way social life in has always been run and will hopefully continue to be run otherwise think of all of the women who would have to stay at home was it a bad error of judgment on his part? I don't think so. I think he has found himself embroiled in something that he had no idea he could possibly be embroiled in. Because you see, he knew that he could be perfectly anonymous in Madrid. And nobody was going to be papping him. Of course, he didn't know the paparazzi might have noticed her, whether they noticed him or not, because she's well known. Genoveva Casa Casanova is well known. She is a readily identifiable face in Spain. And they were walking all about the place without any question of trying to be surreptitious or hiding themselves. So I'm going to read out what Ton Marina says. And how would you know for sure that there wasn't more to the assignation by night? His wife did not look too pleased. He knew how bad this would look, but did it anyhow. Sorry, sometimes you make extremely naive <laughs> statements. <laughs> Thank you for that. Late night dinner in Spain, not unusual, but what ensued looked suspicious. Perhaps it was innocent, but showed poor judgment on his part. How did the ph photographers know where he would be? Who set him up if he was set up? And who would gain by the scandal? Well, those are very interesting questions. And I'm going to answer what people are saying privately. Genoveva Casanova is a reality star in Spain. She evidently likes attention. Yes, she needs money. She's the ex-wife of one of the poorer members of the dukedom of Alba. 
he was son number five. His eldest brother is now the Duke. His mother died and left most of the money and everything to, entailed upon the dukedom, so to speak. Yes, he and his siblings have got small fortunes, but not large fortunes. And Genoveva Casanova is an ex-wife, the ex-wife of a not rich man. She needs to make her way in the world. Did she pull a Sally Farmillo? Sally Farmillo was another society girl who dabbled in the entertainment world and who made sure that her every move was recorded. Not that I'm accusing Genoveva Casanova of anything, but I am saying what people are saying. She did a Sally Farmillo. That's what they're saying. Possibly unjustly of what she has said, very unjustly, but the word in the drawing rooms, as opposed to on the street, is that she thought it would raise her profile, make her more desirable. Is that fair? Is that unfair? I don't think anybody will ever really know because it is quite possible that as they were walking on the streets because she's so well known and because they had clear consciences so they felt they were perfectly entitled to walk on the streets and be out and about without any surreptitious behavior that a photographer recognized them. It's possible. I mean, I've been walking on the streets, not in Spain, but in England, and I've been recognized and I've been papped. So, you know, it goes with the territory. Would you be doing it if you had something to hide? Margaret Smith says, I'm glad you covered the Danish affair rumors. My take on it is that if he was having an affair, he'd be a lot more secretive about it. He needs to be more careful if someone is out to get him. I've read that out because it's a sentiment that many people share, me included. And Dr. Dr. Debo Cherry says, he spent the night and changed clothing at her apartment. It was set up to look like an affair. It wasn't hidden. Well, he left from the apartment to go to the airport. I mean, why wouldn't he change his clothes? Tanya Fabrega says, you are absolutely correct, Lady C. My father was Spanish, my mother Mexican, and having lived in both countries myself, I can agree to the fact that dinner normally starts at 10 p.m. and you can stay out until midnight, especially during the local fiestas. It is enormous fun. And Jenny Dumenigo says, I am half Spanish. And when I'm there, dinner is at 10 p.m. at the earliest, never ends before 2 a.m. And then you have nightcaps, or if it's late enough in the morning, churros and hot chocolate. I'm reading these out so that things are placed in their proper context. It's a storm in a teacup. The whole thing is unfortunate. Of course, nobody is pleased that it has happened. But it is a storm in a teacup. And I'm going to end with a 
smack on my wrist from OKTX boy. Lady C, I must respectfully correct you. Thanks for doing it respectfully. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of blonde-haired, blue-eyed people in Mexico who are not from the top tier of Spanish and European grand families. One needs to look no further than some communities in the state of Aguascalientes, Jalisco, sorry, Jalisco, I need to leave off my Castilian accent, <laughs> Guanajuato and Queretaro, regardless of what the current state of Mexico is, it has often served as a country of refuge for many throughout history. I stand corrected. I was conveying a thought and I didn't do it as precisely as I should. And I didn't do it as precisely as I should because I didn't want it to have snobby overtones. So I'm going to leave the matter right there. I stand corrected and I'm happy to stand corrected. Lucy Cochran says, Dear Lady C, wow! You are, <laughs> sorry, you are an angel in white today. Oh, my head, oh, it's exploding. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question concerning the Harkles' money situation. When they left the UK, they went to Delaware to set up corporations and banking structures. This was all done to protect them and to grow their funds. Do you think the Harkers are truly near bankruptcy? Also, I read an article the other day that the king would be paying for the Harkers' debt before any bankruptcy could happen because it would reflect badly on the monarchy. What do you think? M could sell some of the clothes she bought and wore one time. <laughs> She could even return them if she still owes for them. <laughs> I suppose M is waiting until H receives the last of his inheritance before she divorces him. She's not. The Megans of this world don't move from A to B unless there's a better option uh, on in the offering from where they're moving to. Let's put it that way. I saw it with my mother and I see it with Megan. Everything everybody has told me about her leads me to conclude that she is very much like mummy in that regard. I don't think they are $28 million in debt. I think this is a story put around, possibly to frighten Samantha into settling or dropping the case or not pursuing it. Who knows with them? They usually have a multiplicity of reasons, all of which are spelled money, money, money. Attention, attention, attention. Look at me, 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 look at me. They've never made the money that they claim to, or their people claim that they made. There have never been the hundreds of millions of dollars on the table, or the tens of millions even, that they have, and their PR people have spun as being factual. I've been saying it all along. I come from a world where People had money and you knew what BS was all about. Let's put it that way. So, 
I think we can safely move on to the next subject because I don't think that there's going to be a bankruptcy. And if there were to be a bankruptcy, my understanding is that the king would not be rescuing them. In fact, he might be jubilant that they would be reined in by authorities that he didn't need to, be, to trigger to do the dirty work, let's put it that way. J. Fraw says, attention grab and diversion tactics. If the press is talking about pap walks, poppies, concerts and birthday phone calls and debts, they aren't looking at court cases for both this one and his wife. I think J. Fraw, it's his wife is that one. So it's this one and that one. But I suppose we can call her his wife as well. Their work is to bring in laws to control freedom of speech. And it continues on in the background behind this facade of victimized royal family outcasts. Well, I've read it out because it's a very interesting alternative explanation as to what is a possibility. Yeah, but I don't actually think that it is that carefully constructed and that consciously fabricated. I think they love attention. I think they can't, she especially, he actually could resist. Although he's always liked attention. He simply liked attention privately. Now he's got a taste for attention publicly. Who knows what will go on with him whether she remains in the picture or not. But she has always had a lust for external recognition. Remember when she was an unknown star of suits, number six on the call sheet, not even a proper star. She'd insist that they put her in hotels with a non de plume in case somebody recognized her. Well, I'm here to tell you, as a very recognizable figure in this country, and in fact, when I was last in America, I mean, my kids and I were very entertained while we were waiting to pick up our car at the rent-a-car place, several people came up to me, Americans, so I think I'm recognizable there as well. And you don't see me making the palaver that he makes and she makes because well-adjusted, decent, civilized, mature, sane people don't behave like that. It is the mark of a maladjusted misfit. Maggie Morris says, Hello, Lady C. Thank you for your always insightful videos. It's become the highlight of my day. Oh, thank you very much, Maggie Morris. That's really lovely to hear. The latest card I heard, obviously from the Sussex camp, that Medusa is now suffering from anorexia. <laughs> Whatever next. I didn't know anorexia was said, O-Z-E-M-P-I-C, but what do I know? Is there nothing this creature won't do to gain sympathy? Attention as well. Or is this just another attempt of becoming Diana Machtu? I have often wondered what your thoughts are being a resident of Sussex and the feelings of other residents in general, knowing full well she couldn't point out Sussex on a map. 
lots of love to you and your gorgeous girls well i don't know about the average person in sussex but the people i am friendly with and know do not expect megan as the duchess of sussex to be doing anything for sussex dukedoms usually have a link to the estates and the origins of the holder of the dukedom if it is a non-royal dukedom but if it's a royal dukedom it's there are just a few of them and they're dished out willy-nilly so nobody expects the sussexes to do anything for sussex unless of course we're speaking about sussex the duke and duchess of in which case they've got to be assiduous in doing things for themselves Megan has lost a lot of weight and I have been told how true it is I would hesitate to say firmly for legal reasons but let me put it this way I wouldn't be repeating it if I did not believe that it had a merit Megan set out to lose weight is this her latest stab at being the <laughs> reincarnation really what we mean is the embodiment but everybody says reincarnation although i don't know how you can be reincarnated from somebody who was alive when you were born but anyway her is 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 megan diana's latest evocation well, she's certainly been following Diana's life like a playbook. There's something deeply spooky and deeply chilling and deeply disturbing about that, I would have said. And I would imagine you feel the same way. There is nothing she won't do for attention. Nothing. Ever since she was a little girl she will do anything for attention anything nothing has changed and i'm going to end with heather clayton callahan who says tea towels and washing up cloths are two different things a washing of cloth washes the dishes tea towels dry the dishes thank you for that my mouth slipped i meant drying up cloths sorry about that <laughs> yeah of course you're right well this is an allusion to nikki haslam's tea towels which he doesn't like the word tea towel either he thinks it's common well i know one thing nothing's more common than saying common and on that note i'll say thank you very much for listening i hope this has been of some interest to you if it has please keep the questions and comments coming in so i will know what you want us to be speaking about okay thank you so much and if you have truly enjoyed this please like share subscribe press the notica notification bell and god speed thank you so much bye bye